The star is the Ford Capri. You know, we're still not sure what to make of the 1970s. We don't know whether to look back with fond fascination or appalled astonishment. There were heroes and there were highlights. There were good boys and there were bad. But there are some things we still can't decide if we love or loathe. Like the Capri. Ford's Saturday Night Special says more about the 70s than brute aftershave ever could. But the trouble with the Capri is we've never been able to take it seriously. By the end of its life, it was labouring under a huge social stigma. Like carry-on films, allotments and saucy seaside postcards, it was low rent. So could we ever call such a proletarian heirloom a significant car, a great car, a classic car? Could we ever see ourselves going out and passionately preserving them? The question we need to ask is, was the Capri ever actually any good? Well, the time has come to find out. You could say that the Capri story begins all the way back in the demob days of 1945, when thousands of victorious soldiers returned heroically home from the Second World War to claim their conjugal rights. A quarter of a decade later and those baby boom children had reached car buying age. But the love generation didn't want their wheels square, they wanted them cool. A car that was fun, stylish and made a statement. Something just a little bit different. And thanks to Ford, a new type of auto opium was parked just round the corner. By the end of the 60s, the Ford Motor Company was on a massive high, winning Grand Prix, Indianapolis and Le Mans, plus rallies by the score. Dagenham was rolling out cars like the giant-killing Lotus Cortina, the all-conquering GT40 and the energetic Escort Twin Cam. The Blue Oval could do no wrong. Well, you see, the thing about Ford at the time, really, I think, was that... Um, we had two kinds of reputations. We had reputation for jolly good value for money, good reliability, trust to Ford and that kind of thing. And then we had this searing reputation on the tracks. And there was a desire to have a sports car, and they weren't yet getting something like it onto the roads. But in America, they had the million-selling Mustang, the perfect blueprint for a European personality car. Ford even codenamed their glam new coupe, Colt. I think we were uh, aiming at ourselves. I mean, young, you know, uh, enthusiast people who want to have a sports car or something nice to, to drive around instead of, of being, let's say, a typical family car. I think that we wanted, obviously, in Europe to have something like the Mustang. I mean, that, that was, uh, you know, everybody uh, I remember at my age at the time was dreaming from a Mustang. And um, we were very, let's say, inspired by the design of the Mustang when we did the Capri. We wanted to give the car a certain dynamism. We wanted to give a design, you know, something that was moving. Uh, and try to give it a quite simple silhouette, but something, you know, very dynamic. 
But at the last moment, Ford's designers changed that simple silhouette into one of the most distinctive in the world. That oval back side window became a styling motif that would stay with the Capri forever. Ford's hyperactive advertising men came up with a brilliantly simple slogan and a spectacularly sexist TV ad. Once again, Ford leads the way with Capri, the car you always promised yourself. Well, if you think it's too good to be true, look. Look again. Go ahead. Dream some more. The new Ford Capri is very generous with its room and comfort. Seats four, even five adults. Capri, the car you always promised yourself, is at your Ford dealers now. So what was the market like in 1969? What were the Capri's main rivals? Well, Ford published this confidential guide for salesmen, the Capri versus the competition. And they reckoned it was up against cars like the Morris 1300, the Sunbeam Stiletto, the Vauxhall Viva 1600, the Rover 2000 and the Vauxhall Victor. What they were saying was that there was no competition. There was just this huge yawning abyss in the market. And along comes the Capri and fills it perfectly. And Ford had a Capri for everybody. There were weedy 1300s, brisk 1600s, rising all the way up to torquey 2 litres and thundering 3 litres. There were L-packs, X-packs, E-packs, R-packs, XLs, XLRs, GTs and GXLs. Not to mention matte black bonnets and vinyl roofs. And if that wasn't enough, you could buy specially tweaked versions like the Race Proven and the Broad Speed, rumbling monsters that could crack 130 miles an hour. But for Capri Man, the stock item was disarming enough. A whisker over 1,400 quid bought you this, the 3-litre GXL, and what a package it was. You got a 3-litre V6 cast iron lump, more clocks than Switzerland, double headlamps, alloy wheels, bucket seats, centre console. It was the motoring equivalent of mescaline. And you can see why Ford managed to shift a million Mark 1s in five years. And even after it went out of production in 74, the Mark 1 was still best for boy races. And some boys took their racing very seriously indeed. Whenever I used to see a Capri advertised in the paper that used to sound good, I just used to end up going and buying it, sometimes over two or three at, at the same time. We used to have a fish shop and uh, everyone knew that we were keen uh, Capri owners. From the early days, which was again, as I say, from 78, 79, everyone just used to race around. I mean, I myself have owned about 35 GXLs. And when I used to sell them on, I used to, they always used to end up in, in the North London area. So all my mates used to drive around in them and there was just sort of chaotic racing everywhere, sort of disregard for sort of speed limits, for traffic lights, for anything. Sometimes we'd be working at the counter on a busy day. Two or three cars would come outside revving. Cars would take the overall off, get in his car. I'd carry on working at the shop. He would go out there and uh, give him a hiding and come back to the shop. <laughs> and there was a section of the uh, North Circular Road that everyone used to go to from the lights and race. It was, just, it was about just over a quarter of a mile stretch. And um, we used to race from the lights up to the bridge where everyone from the petrol station we used to meet at used to wait over the bridge to watch the winner come underneath. I mean, that was, uh, 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 used to get up to about 150 cars turn up there on a Friday night. And it used to, that used to be sort of organized racing, but illegal. I mean, police were there a lot of the time, but just, they just couldn't catch anyone, basically. 90% of the Capris that used to go around uh, never used to have insurance, tax, MOT, not even on their names, and they used to just used to run right. I mean, in the end, they uh, they just had to break it up every Friday night. The police just used to go there in, in van loads, and as people used to turn up, they used to just turn them white, and that's how it all stopped. When Ford bought out the Mark II in 74 with its opening rear hatch, they were hoping to woo some family men and company car drivers. 
Mind you, they continued to smear on the sex with a trowel, and the Capri was still cast as a philanderer's car. The Mark II was even more photogenic, with cleaner cut lines, a new bonnet bulge, alloys, chin spoiler, flush door handles, and a large helping of attitude. The Capri had testosterone to burn. But try as it might, it could never quite shake off its association with chips, beer and tattoos. No self-respecting Essex wide boy would be seen cruising the South End prom in anything else. Capri man may have coveted the Mark II like his sovereign ring and his gold identity bracelet, but actually it didn't sell as well as the Mark I.